Hello and welcome to another lecture in social neuroscience. This is our second lecture on empathy. In this lecture, I want to focus on what prompts us to feel the pain of others. I'll begin by just making a distinction between trait versus state empathy, something maybe I should have brought up at the last lecture. And then we'll look at three sort of broad examples of, of situational factors that cause us to feel empathy for others. And those would be social categories, kinship schema and cuteness, and then finally crying and tears. So kind of going back to the big picture that I introduced the last lecture, we we're trying to look at, um, you know, basically how experience sharing and perspective taking work together to give us empathic concern. And what I wanted to do is look more at that green box today on external factors. Now, keep in mind, when I say external factors, I'm talking about external to the person. And so as you move around in the world, there's going to be things that attract your attention and then maybe focus your empathy on whatever it's going on. But the other thing about external factors might also include things about your internal dispositions, your traits. And so there is a distinction in the empathy literature between trait and state empathy. And just I want to just take a moment to talk about trait empathy. Trait empathy is basically this idea that you may be chronically high or low in empathy. And there are several different measures that you can give people to to look at people's trait empathy. Um, one of the most common ones is this thing here called the Interpersonal Reactivity Index that was developed by Davis back in 1980. It has a series of items that you indicate how well it describes you as you complete it. As you can see here, uh, item one is I daydream and fantasize with some regularity about things that might happen to me. Or I often have tender, concerned feelings for people less fortunate than me. Now, those little letters that are behind in the brackets represent four subscales that were developed around this measure. And one subscale is called perspective taking, which makes sense, right? So perspective taking, again, is this more cognitive empathy perspective. And so the tendency here is to spontaneously adopt the psychological point of, other, uh, point of view of other people. So if you score high on PT, on the items that are labeled there PT, you would be high in perspective taking. And then we have fantasy, which is it taps respondents' tendencies to transpose themselves imaginatively into the feelings and actions of fictitious characters in books, movies, and plays. So this is sort of an interesting aspect about this as a trait. Like, are you the kind of person that gets absorbed in movies and in books with fictional characters? You know that they're fictional, yet you kind of feel yourselves getting involved in their feelings and actions. And then we have empathic concern, which is maybe more on the um, overall combination of putting um, perspective taking and affective sharing together. But this is your other oriented feelings of sympathy and concern for the unfortunate other people. And finally, there's personal distress, which measures self-oriented feelings of personal anxiety and unease in tense interpersonal settings. So again, the idea is that you would give somebody a questionnaire like this, like the IRI, and then based on those scales, their scores on those scales, you'd have some idea of individual differences. And of course, some people are going to be high on these scales and maybe high overall on empathy. Other people are going to be lower on it. And, it, and the idea is that it's a trait that is fairly consistent over long periods of time or maybe even for years in an individual. The other way that you could look at trait empathy is sort of looking at it from the perspective of those different tests that I talked about last time. So these would be tests that measure theory of mind or another way of doing this is what's called a false belief task. So I'll tell you about a false belief task that's commonly used. This is when you give a story in which there's one character that will have a false belief about the actual location of an object. Okay, so you tell a little story and this person in the story believes that there's a object in this box over here, but it's really over there. And so the idea is, can the person who sees this, um, who hears about this story, understand that even though they know, the person who's being tested knows where the object is, do they recognize that the character has a false belief about where the location of the object is? Children that are younger than three to four years old have problems with this test, so it's hard for them to really dissociate their own way of thinking about the way they see the object and where they think that the character thinks it is. Now, one variant of this task, there's actually several false belief tasks, a very commonly used one that was developed by Baron Cohen back in the 80s is called the Sally Ann task. And this is the way the Sally Ann task would be 
presented. So you'd have it like a series of cards, like this is Sally, this is Anne. Sally puts her ball in the basket, and you see there's Anne just sitting there over on the right. Sally goes away. Then Anne gets up and she moves the ball to her box, right? And then Sally comes back, Anne is gone, and the question is, where will Sally look for her ball? And so again, very young children will look at this and just say, well, the ball is obviously in the box. That's where Sally's going to go look for it. But the problem is that Sally has a false belief then, right? Sally is walking back into the room thinking that the ball is still in her basket. So the correct answer would be that Sally is going to look in the basket. So that's a way of measuring perspective taking again, just through a false belief and whether or not a person maybe who has some sort of um, brain damage or uh, some other disorder causes them to not um, pass this test and it would tell us a little bit more about whether or not they can actually do perspective taking and then properly have that element of empathy um, as an individual difference. All right, so that's all about trait empathy. But today I want to focus on state empathy. And so state empathy is more about how you feel at the moment in terms of empathy for somebody out there, a target, somebody or some animal that needs help or is calling for help. And I mentioned that some of these external factors that influence our empathic responses would include these things on the left, these two columns on the left that are called triggers or elicitors, and then we have moderators on the right. So this is all from the last lecture. And so these are all just different things that we've been elaborating in some research we've been doing in my lab on static target cues, emotional cues, some situational factors, and relationship factors. What I thought I'd do for the rest of this lecture is just focus on three of these triggers or elicitors and show you a little bit about some of the research that's been done in this area on social category cues. Then we'll talk about cuteness and how that affects our empath empathy and whether or not we're going to have an empathic response. And then finally, we'll look at crying and tears. All right, so let's move to social categorizations. Well, so what I mean by social categorization is something we've talked about in previous lectures, the fact that we tend to put people into groups. Very easily, we like to socially categorize people so that we say they're in our in-group or they're in their out-group. And you might remember some of the quickest categorizations that we make have to do with things like gender, age, and race, all right? So once we do that, once we make those categorizations, how does that affect our empathy for somebody who might be in our group or might be outside that group that we uh, have defined? And so I actually wrote a review paper about this in 2016, but there's lots of other papers out there that, are, that have looked at this. But some things that we know is that, for instance, that people tend to have more empathy for female targets regardless of the observer's gender. So here's one that's interesting in the sense that even women will show, I'm uh, sorry, men will show more empathy for female targets, their outgroup on the, on the categorization of gender, uh, regardless, again, of the person's gender. But this may apply mainly to adolescents and children. So it could be that this is largely a fact that adolescent girls or girls who are children will elicit more empathy than we will find for um, male targets. We also know that age matters, that older people tend to elicit more empathy than younger people. And we know that same race people elicit empathy more than different race people. And so all of these you can kind of see, maybe with the exception of the top one there with about gender, is that we tend to put people into these social categories and then once they're in the out group or in the in group, we're going to treat them differently in terms of the amount of empathy that they elicit when it comes time to possibly have empathy for them, when they're in pain, when something is misfortunate has happened to them, when they've had a flood, whatever it happens to be. And these biases in empathy then can occur during any of the processes that we showed in the big picture. That is, it could happen during our affective or experience sharing and things having to do with mimicry, or it could have effects on our perspective taking, etc. Let me give you a couple examples of what I mean. So first of all, we have this study here by Zhu et al. in 2009. Uh, Do you feel my pain? Group membership modulates empathic neural responses. So what they were focusing on here is the aspect of empathy that has more to do with experience sharing, and that's what's called perception-action coupling. This is like mimicry, and you might remember that I showed you that a photograph from an Allport book in which he was looking at these fans who were kind of leaning in and making the sort of same moves as the bowler out there in the All Ireland Bowls. Well, we take on the posture and the movements of another person when we do this, and this could make it easier for us then to have empathy for them. So if we get caught up in mimicking and, 
and doing our same sort of actions as their, that other person there, then that could affect our empathy for them. And so what they wanted to look at in this study is such coupling, this perception action coupling, is it affected by group membership? So they tested people in Beijing. This is where these researchers are at. Um, and what they did is they tested 17 Chinese students and, seven, and 16 Caucasian university students there in Beijing. And they had two independent variables that they manipulated in the study. One was the race of the target. So the target's going to be that there's somebody out there in the world that you're looking at as a stimulus. Um, and there, that person could either be another Caucasian if you're a Caucasian university student, or it could be another Chinese student, or it could be the opposite race from you, the different race, a Caucasian person looking at a Chinese face, right? So that's the race of the target. And then we also have the pain of the stimulus. So a stimulus is going to be applied to that person's face, and it's either painful or not painful. And then the dependent variables, we're largely looking at in this in terms of brain activity in an fMRI study. And they looked at brain activity in the ACC and the insula because we know from previous pain research that these are areas that become more active in the pain network when you personally feel pain. You might also remember these are the same kinds of areas that were looked at with social pain, like when we looked at ostracism. And then finally, they also included frontal lobe sites because they thought perhaps frontal lobe might have something to do with sort of like top-down categorization processing. Now, in this study, what the stimuli were, were three-second video clips. And these are just some stills from the video clips. So you can see that they have um, 48 of these clips showing faces of six Chinese and six Caucasian models. And then each model is going to be shown in four different ways, I guess, uh, four different possible things, but you can see that the face is always a neutral expression. Now on the Caucasian faces, you can see that they're holding up a needle to the cheek. And so that looks like it could be painful, but she's just showing a neutral expression. You can see that then we have a non-painful thing where she's got a cotton swab again, or a Q-tip that's being applied to the skin. So it's the same action of applying something to the skin, but it shouldn't be painful. And then the same thing's done for the Chinese model faces. So you can see that she, the right model there has a a needle being put into the skin or it has again a q-tip or a cotton bud being applied to the skin. Then what happened was after they saw each one of those trials the participant would make a rating about how painful they thought that model might be feeling. How much pain are they feeling from a 0 to a 10 rating scale. And the rating scale then like I said could go um, 10 would be like the maximum amount of pain, 0 is like no pain at all. And then we can divide this up into the Chinese participants and the Caucasian participants and see if there's any differences in the way that they respond. And so over on the left, you can see this is when we have the Chinese participants looking at either a Chinese face or a Caucasian face. And you can see that when the needle is applied to their face, that these Chinese participants actually do rate them high in pain. It looks painful to them that they have this needle applied to the skin. And there's no difference though between Chinese faces and Caucasian faces. They're higher though on needles than they are when they look at video clips of Q-tips being presented to the face. On the right, we see the Caucasian participants. Now you'll notice that overall, they are rating the needle pain lower for some reason. They're down more closer to five in terms of their rating scale. But again, they rate those needle video clips as higher in pain than the Q-tip or the cotton bud one. Um, but the, the other important point here is that there's again no difference between Chinese faces and Caucasian faces. They think that both groups would show um, equivalent amount of pain to having a needle applied to their skin. So, so far we're not seeing sort of that classic in-group, out-group rating where you might think that the participant would show a little bit more favoritism and a little bit more empathy towards their same race in terms of like how much pain that person is feeling. But right now we're not seeing that. However, let's look at the brain activity. So in the brain activity, like I said, they focused a lot on the ACC and the insula. And you can see that they've sort of grouped the insula in with more like left frontal, ACC, SMA, runs down towards the insula. Um, so they have these fairly broad regions in this particular study in 2009. But the key thing to focus in here on is that, again, we have the Caucasian participants this time on the left, the Chinese participants on the right for C and D. And if I look here, you can see that when a Caucasian participant uh, looks at a Caucasian face versus a Chinese face, they're showing more activity in the ACC and the SMA when they see the, um, the video 
clip of pain being applied to the face, so when the needle's being applied to the skin. And so that's much greater for Caucasian faces than it is for Chinese faces. What about the Chinese participants? What do they do? Over there on the right, you can see that when they see the pain being applied to a Chinese face, they're showing more ACC activity to that than they are to a Caucasian face. So each group is showing more stimulation of the uh, pain response, right? You know, this circuit supposedly that's involved here that they're trying to argue in this paper is identified through the ACC and the SMA, that that area is becoming more activated for that participant's own in-group. So they're better able to do the perception action coupling, um, and, then they, uh, and then that's why they show this bias then on, this, on, on the ACC and the SMA, that they're showing more supposed of a pain response. Now again, going back to the ratings, you might have noticed again that the ratings didn't show this in-group, out-group effect. And so Perhaps the, you know, the this this sort of perception action coupling occurs really early. That's like automatic. But then when it comes time to make a rating of empathy, maybe these participants are using more regulation strategies or don't want to look prejudiced, and so they rate the empathy the same in this particular instance. But early on, they seem to be showing better perception action coupling for their own in group when that in group target is feeling pain. So that does kind of provide us um, some evidence, maybe sort of negatively, that we have this sort of automatic bias in our um, initial impulses to show empathy towards in-group members over out-group members. Now, can anything be done to fix this empathy bias? Now, there are, of course, lots of answers to this question, and you could do training, you could have exercises to reduce prejudice through contact and so on. Here's an interesting solution. Um, in, in this one, they're looking at the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which, my gosh, there's so much work that's been done to try to reduce um, the animosity between Israelis and Palestinians in that conflict. This study looked at what what happens if you give people oxytocin? Does that increase their empathy to pain in the context of this conflict? So in this study, they did a double-blind, placebo-controlled, within-subject crossover design. So that means that all the participants are going to go through all three conditions. It's done in a random order. Um, they get a placebo condition. They're also going to get the drug condition, which is oxytocin. And the experimenters are blind to the condition. So it's a very well-done experiment. They have 55 Israeli Jewish participants. They didn't have any Palestinian participants here, right? So we have Israeli Jewish participants, and they're rating their empathy to the pain of an in-group target, a neutral out-group target, which in this case would be Europeans. So these Jewish, Israeli Jewish participants, their in-group is going to be other Jewish participants. The out-group is going to be Europeans. And then there's this adversary out-group, which are Palestinian targets. Now, they don't just show faces and all that kind of thing in this particular study. What they wanted to do is have a little bit more control here. And so what they did is they actually just used hands, <laughs> pictures of hands to, that could possibly be feeling pain. And again, they wanted to know then, would oxytocin increase empathy for that adversary outgroup? They would assume that without placebo, with, I'm sorry, without the oxytocin, and you're just looking at the placebo condition, that they would show more empathy for the Israeli Jewish participant, uh, sorry, targets over Palestinian targets, right? But would the people in the oxytocin group maybe not show that, okay? So again, the stimuli were pictures of hands and feet in painful and in neutral situations. And before they would show a picture of a hand or a foot in a painful or a neutral situation, they had a prompt, a little slide of the name of the person that supposedly this hand or this foot belongs to. And they used names that were typical names for each of these three ethnic groups. So what you'd expect in Israel for Jewish um, names, what you'd expect for neutral outgroup European names, and what you might find for Palestinian names, okay? So they're going to put a name, and then you're going to see a picture, and then after the picture's up, you're going to go ahead and make a rating of how much pain you think that person has um, as a result of the stimulus that happens to that hand or to that foot. So it kind of looks like this. You got 750 milliseconds, like in this case it says Mark, so I'm assuming that's a European neutral outgroup name, and then 67 milliseconds pass, and then you see this image of this hand reaching into a hot um, grill of a car, and then you're supposed to rate how much pain there would be there, okay? 
So you do that for all three out groups or three target groups. You have your Arab Palestinians, you have your Jewish uh, Israelis, you have Europeans, right? And so what do they see here? Here's the results. Well, the results were that the oxytocin condition increased the pain ratings for the Palestinian stimuli compared with what happened in the placebo condition. Maybe what we should do is look at the dark bars. Those are the oxytocin conditions. So that's when they're having some oxytocin presented to them nasally, okay? The placebo, they also had something presented to them nasally, but it didn't have any oxytocin in it. And you can see that for European and for Jewish um, targets, that they rate the pain, that's what VAS is, is the pain rating. They rate that pain rating equally high for Europeans and Jews. Um, the European and Jewish targets are rated high in pain. And then you can see that the um, that what's lower though is that people who are depicted as having a Arab or a Palestinian name, they have a lower rating of pain. So the idea is that, wow, wow, I, I think that those European and um, Israeli Jewish faces, I sorry, Jewish hands and feet are probably feeling a lot of pain in the painful conditions. So I rate them as high in pain, but I don't give as much of a pain rating for the Arab um, named faces and hands. But then when you give them the oxytocin, you can see that in those dark bars that what happens there is it doesn't really have much of an effect on the ratings of pain for the European or for the Israeli Jewish um, names. But it does have this positive impact on what happens with the Arab or Palestinian named hands and faces, and you, uh, sorry, hands and feet. And you can see there that the under the oxyto oxytocin condition, they're actually giving them higher pain ratings that's equivalent to what they give to the other two groups. So the oxytocin seems to be wiping away any bias in the pain ratings that these Israeli Jewish participants are giving to their adversary outgroup. And so it suggests that maybe oxytocin can fix this empathy bias um, if you just give it enough and spray it into the nose. So I'll leave this social categorization topic here on this sort of more positive note, but obviously more work needs to be done on this particular topic. Let's move on to number three, Kinden schema and cuteness as another possible external variable that could affect our empathy. Now, Kinshin schema is a German word, and it was originally identified by Conrad Lorenz, the ethologist, back in 1943. He postulated that there's a set of physical characteristics that happen in the animal kingdom that make up the baby schema. That's what Kinchin schema translates into, the baby schema, and that these same characteristics are also labeled as cute by us in our language, okay? And so, he suggested that humans see baby schema in infant humans, but that these also a lot of these characteristics that pop up in other animals as well. And so what would be characteristics that make up the baby schema? You can see the difference here between a baby face and a adult face. Um, they have large round eyes under the baby schema. They have a head that's like, looks like it's too large for the body. They have high eyebrows. They have full cheeks and they have a small chin. So these are all characteristics physically of what makes up the baby schema. And people generally find these baby schema characteristics makes the individual look cute. And we think about that when we look at babies, of course, but also adults could have these sorts of characteristics as well. Um, this is just a quick review of some research that comes from this article by Kringlebach et al. in 2016. And we can see that we, that is infants, children, and adults, tend to look longer at cute faces and we find them more attractive. So we find these cute faces that have kinden schema, schema um, more attractive and we like to look at them longer. We also prefer animals, toys, and cartoon characters that have kinshin schema. And so very much uh, we know that Disney and toy manufacturers and all sorts of different um, companies out there have figured this out and they prey on us by making sure that we see certain kinds of targets as having these kinshin schema. And we also know that our brain responds faster to these faces as well. It's almost like we are sort of pre-wired to pay attention to um, faces that have this kinshin schema. So what's going on with all of these cute faces? Why do we do this? Well, what Kringlebach et al. talked about in their paper in Trends in Cognitive Sciences in 2016 is that they thought that cuteness probably plays a key role in parent-infant relations. 
And this not only includes, by the way, visual stimuli, but there's also other things that fit in into the Kinchin schema that include auditory cues, like the way that an infant laughs or how it babbles, and even its smell. So all of these things kind of play a role in our cuteness or fondness for cuteness in parent-infant relations. You see, they argue that caring for an infant for that novice parent is challenging at first, and they need to kind of find something rewarding to keep their attention and focus on this um, infant that has all of these different needs. And so perhaps what happens is, at first, we need those kinship schema to kind of just draw our attention to this cute little baby that needs help, but, um, and, and it helps us then guide us to our, what are the attention that the child needs. But perhaps a learning process sets in where the parent develops expertise on caring for the infant. And that would mean then as they get better and better at it, they don't need the cuteness skill, uh, cues as much. It's not as necessary then as the child grows older. Now some key brain areas that, that seem particularly responsive to Kinden schema would include things like the OFC, the ACC, the nucleus accumbens because of its role in um, reward processing, the anterior insula, the amygdala, and the supplementary motor area. None of these are unique for caregiving behavior, but they all seem to be responsive to cues when you manipulate them in stimuli that have to do with Kinden schema. So here's just a quick example that shows you in a, one of these studies that Kringlebach et al. talked about was that they looked at the nucleus accumbens there in the lower right picture of the brain. And you can see that on the far right that when they manipulated an image, and you can do this, by the way, with adult faces and make them look more like baby faces or less like baby faces, that the more the stimulus had the characteristics of the baby schema, the more the nucleus accumbens becomes um, active. And it seems to tell us, you know, this is a rewarding thing to look at. We like looking at cute faces that have big eyes and all these other features that we were just talking about. And again, this also works with sounds and smells that, that tell us about cuteness of faces. And just one more thing to keep in mind is that also this is going to take a role in things like puppies, kittens, all sorts of cute stimuli that are out there um, that you could have this sort of response to. Now, what about how all this plays into empathy? I haven't even talked about empathy yet. Well, what we think goes on here is that we tend to have more empathy for cute animals and cute people and cute babies and children than those who are not. So something about cuteness makes us have more empathy for them. Again, possibly because of that parent-infant relationship that we've maybe sort of used now when we see anybody who kind of reminds us of infants, right? And it could be that the cuteness expands our moral circle and includes beings whom we don't usually consider worth our sympathies. That is, somebody who might be in our out group but still has some cuteness about them, some kinden schema, would cause us then to perhaps have empathy for them. And adults who have baby faces or other infant-like characteristics elicit our empathy more as well. Here's just a quick example. This is a study by Listener et al. in 2008. It's just a behavioral study where they looked at um, what would happen if you described a woman who's in need. So this is a woman who like, thinks she's lost some money or something and she needs some help. And they go ahead and ask the participant, would you like to help this woman? But they show a picture of her. She's either uh, the picture on the left or they've manipulated her picture and she looks like the one on the right. The one on the right has more of the kinden schema. So she has more of that cuteness about her in the face. It's the same woman, but they've just manipulated the image. And then they look to see how that affects um, the participant's response in wanting to help that woman. And what they find is that they were more likely to want to help her if she looks like the person on the right. So again, the more she has those characteristics, the more these cute characteristics, the more we want to have empathy. We have empathy for her and want to um, then do pro-social things for her to help her out. Now, let's go to our third and our fourth topic for today, our third external factor, and that's crying and tears. And this is where I'm going to tell you about some of the research we've been doing in our lab. Now, crying and tears, how does that affect empathy? Well, you think about what is crying. Crying is this shedding of tears that often occurs when a person's experiencing strong emotions. Um, and here we'll just assume that the person's being genuine. Non-human animals apparently don't shed tears this way. They might have tears, but their tears are often used for cleaning their eyes when their eyes are dry or they got something in their eyes. They don't tend to show the same kind of shedding of tears in terms of crying the way humans do. 
So when do people cry? Well, there's all sorts of situations that you see people cry in. Um, they obviously are feeling bad. They need to be comforted. Something's going on. Um, so when people cry, you see it in all sorts of situations. Um, adults do this. Men do it. Women do it. Children do it. And then the question is, why are people crying? Why do we even engage in this behavior? Why do we make water, you know, some wetness come down our cheeks and, and we have this kind of crying response? Well, the answer that we and other researchers have come up with is that crying's effects on others is that it tears signal to other people that we need help or possibly forgiveness, okay? So it's something about enduring ourselves to others so they're gonna feel empathy for us and then wanna give us some help, all right? So we're gonna possibly get your empathy um, when I cry because my tears signal to you that I need help or maybe it's in some situations I need forgiveness for something that I've done, but I'm t signaling you um, that my genu I need genuinely need help here and that's why I have tears on my face. There's lots of research on this already, many studies that have been done over the last 20 years on it. I'll go ahead and just show you a little bit about what, again, what we've done. One thing we did was we were actually part of a very large multinational study that was just published in 2021. You can see my name down, down near the bottom there. My PhD student, my former PhD student, Leah Sharman, actually took the lead here and is up near the top. Um, and what we did is we looked at how um, participants in all these different countries responded to having tears in a face versus a, tear, a face that doesn't have tears. And we basically found that um, across all 41 countries, you find that people respond more to wanting to help somebody who's crying versus somebody who's not showing tears on their face. So how have we actually done this at UQ? Um, I'll just show you a little bit about just a really kind of quick example of how we've studied the effects of crying and tears on other people. So in looking at this, we, we've been looking at how tears affect judgments of sadness and genuineness. And so we had to create stimuli to present to our participants where we can manipulate the tears. There's a couple of choices that we had here. One is that we could find faces like this that come from international stimuli, uh, picture-based stimuli that are used in other research, where you've got people looking sad, so she's got like a sad expression. And then what we can do is use Photoshop and add tears to her face. So that looks like we have the same face with tears. Here she is without tears, right? So that's one thing we can do is just make fake tears on sad looking faces and then see, do people find that face looking sadder than that face? Okay. Another thing we could do is find real pictures of, of real people supposedly on the internet who have tears on their face and then we use Photoshop to remove digitally their tears from their face. Okay. And so that's an example here of tears, no tears. Here's an example of the guy's tears have been removed. There they are with the tears still on. Here's somebody who has her tears removed. Here's how the picture actually appeared originally. And finally, here's a woman who's got the tears on her face, but then we clean her up digitally so she doesn't have the tears. You can still see her eyes are a little bit wet, but she doesn't have these tears that are rolling down her cheek. So my former PhD student, Leah Sharman, when she first started working with me as an undergraduate, um, one of the things that she did, she went out and found pictures like this from the internet of people crying and then created a whole set of stimuli that we could use in our research where we could manipulate whether the person had tears or not. And so we have all of these different stimuli. You can see um, I told her to go ahead and just find faces of any age, any race, any um, direction of their eyes. You can see that there's just a wide variety of stimuli here. And the idea is that we just really wanted to get very naturalistic, naturalistic looking faces um, and then be able to play with the tears on the face. So these are all pictures of people actually crying and then we go ahead and remove their tears. We've also done it the other way where I told you that we could also use um, predetermined stimuli that, uh, that have like a face of somebody looking sad and then we add the tears to the sad face. Um, we really don't find any difference. It doesn't matter whether we do it this way with natural occurring pictures of, of people with cry tears on their face or we use those more artificial stimuli where we add the tears to the face. Either way, we get the same sorts of effects. And here's what the effect is. So we ask people, how sad does this person look when you see this person looking sad and they have tears on their face or they don't? So this is looking across all of the different stimuli. And we can actually look at Two, whether or not the face that you see in the picture is a male face or a female face. And what we generally find is that um, when you add tears to the face, and there's tears there to their sadness, that people rate the face as looking sadder than they do when there's no tears. 
So the tears really are signaling more sadness. You can see whether it's a male face or a female face. We call this difference, by the way, between what happens with tears versus no tears, everything else being equal, we call that the tear effect, okay? And we see the tear effect again and again. That's basically what we found in that 41 country study is we found the tear effect all over the place. People respond to these faces when there are more tears there. We also looked in this particular study at things like um, besides sadness, like how much they're expressing their emotion, how much they're looking at, uh, how genuine it looks, and so on. So you can see the tear effect happens there for both male and female targets. But you might also notice that there's a slight difference in how much of a difference the tear effect is for males and females. Right now you can see, I think, that we get a bigger tear effect for male faces than we do for female faces. That is, they both show the effects of tears. Both male and female targets <clears throat> do increase ratings of sadness when there are tears on the face. However, you can see though that on the left there, that male faces, when they don't have tears, are, they're a bit lower. And then when you add the tears to the face, they go up a lot. So we get a bigger tear effect for males than we do for females. <clears throat> that suggests that we may perceive um, the gender of the person interacting with whether or not they have tears on the face, that that somehow affects our empathy. And so this is interesting. You can go back to Darwin. He actually wrote about this in 1872. He said, especially in the male sex, weeping soon ceases to be caused by or to express bodily pain. This may be accounted for by its being thought weak and unmanly by men, both of civilized and barbarous races, to exhibit bodily pain by any outward sign. So what Darwin was suggesting back in 1872 is that you get to a certain point in male development and males stop showing tears as much. And because they stop showing these tears, um, maybe that just becomes a more of a rare event when you see a male with tears on his face. What do we actually know about gender and tears? What's the research tell us? Well, we do know that men cry less than women do and that this seems to be a, a universal gender difference. So there was some studies done in, in back in the 90s where they looked at diary studies and uh, frequency reports of men and women crying. And just overall, you find that men report that they cry less often than women do. There are also interesting developmental differences that it turns out that between the ages of zero and like 11, there really isn't any difference between boys and girls and how much they cry. They're both equally likely to cry. And then when, when you get to around the age of 11, girls kind of hang steady there and they just keep crying about the same amount no matter what age they are after the age of 11. But boys go down in terms of how much they cry. And it could be that during adolescence, because of culture, uh, that they're being taught that they shouldn't cry, that there's something unmanly or un unboyish about that. And so they start to suppress their tears and you see fewer tears as boys get older. So there seems to be this key thing that happens during adolescence that differentiates boys and girls in terms of how much they show tears on their face. And if you just think about stereotypes just generally, I mean, there's songs like this, there's movies that according to stereotypes, women should show their tears, but men are not supposed to show uh, cry, uh, showing that they can cry. Um, so why would women and men cry differently? It could be because of social roles that maybe uh, because of socialization, women are expected to show warmth. And so therefore they should show that they have tears and it's okay to do that. Whereas men are socialized to be more instrumental, you know, helpful in stressful situations. And women are socialized to express their emotions and seek the help. So it's sort of like this whole social thing, like the damsel in the distress, the women should cry and show that they need help and men are supposed to come and rescue them. There's even been evolution explanations for this, that there's sort of an intersexual pressure according to one of these evolutionary hypotheses that maybe women actually in their interactions with men cry to de-escalate the conflict with the men. Or it could be that in intrasexually that among women, they cry because it helps form bonds between them. But the other thing you can kind of think about is that perhaps just the situations in which men and women find themselves matter. Perhaps it is that women pay more may more frequently end up in situations where they feel helpless or powerless. And because they're feeling helpless or powerless, they need to signal to other people they need help. And again, these situations could just be because it's an uh, unfairness inherent in society that women end up in situations that are just tougher. Um, and in these tougher situations, they cry to signal that they need help, and that they don't have the power that they need. 
So the bottom line then would be that we expect women to tear up when they're sad, but we don't expect men to do so. And so in the case of our tear effect, the reason why we see a bigger tear effect for men is that it's so unusual for a man to cry that it has a bigger bounce, a bigger effect of their tears than it does when you see women cry. And like I said, both show the tear effect, but men benefit more from the tear effect, it looks like in our research, than it does for women. So that just gives you a little sample of some of the research we've done in our lab looking at tears. We have several studies now that we've looked at and, and looking at things like culture and gender and, and so on. But I'll leave it there just to give you just a little taste of how um, we've been looking at this in our lab. So in conclusion then, we've been looking at largely these external factors, and that was largely because I wanted to look at what you know, affects state empathy, um, what are some of these elicitors out there. But we did differentiate between trait and state empathy at this lecture. Then we reviewed some of the work on social categories, kinship schema and cuteness, and finally crying in tears. All right, got two lectures left. I'll see you at the next lecture.